Okay. I think it's just a different slide. I sent a new presentation uh, yesterday for Maximilian. Just a second, everyone. Hello, hello. What? Hello, hello, hello. Okay, everyone. So they are figuring out actually my slides, which I really hope they can play soon. But I'm going to start introducing myself. So I'm Giovanna, but everybody calls me Gigi. I am event and community producer at the Central Land Foundation. And today, I really want to share with you a little bit about not just what we do, but a mix of what I have been researching as a PhD, but as well as what I do as producer, what everyone does in the content team in the Central Land Foundation, and how we have been doing a lot of amazing creative work with our creators in our community. So our speak today will be pretty much showing to you a little bit about how the creation process happens in the Central Land, but I would do some sort of overview about how the idea of immersion, right, or virtual reality, mixed reality comes into place because I think we're very used to separate the physical and the digital world. And I particularly believe that actually it's all part of the same experience. So here we are. Thank you, everyone. So today we're going to talk about creative activations in the metaverse from virtual spaces to XR. So the first point that I want to say is that when we think about creativity, we most of the time are talking about adapting. And I was born originally in Brazil, which is a country where we do a lot of hacking and adaptation. And I think all of us feel like that in our practical lives, right? But when you really have to get out of the box and your comfort zone, you create amazing things. Besides, I think it's very important that we think that the virtual worlds that we see today coming into place, especially with the XR technologies or metaverses, they are not something so new. They are actually a continuum of something we have been doing for centuries. So as a PhD, I'm going to mix a little bit of very interesting images with a little bit of history. So if we look back into time, and I think the speeches before me, they were very good in doing a historical review, you're going to see that we have been trying to capture imagination and capturing what we aim, right? Creating these virtual spaces in our mind and expressing those. And we did that in prehistory already. And then, as we see the hard history, we see that it's not just about representing a wish. It's about provoking, right, with virtual spaces that could be extremely surrealistic. This is Bosch. I really love his work. I think he tries to provoke us visually. It is immersive. And he was not in the XR generation yet. Then we look at Kandinsky, another one that I really like. And in some researches, some critiques say that he was a big fan of Wagner, the composer. And some of his pieces are actually a visual representation of Wagner's composition. And that is amazing, because it was not Windows Player yet, really making images, but Kandinsky was expressing the virtual images he had in his mind for something that was not technically visual. 
And then when we look into technology, we go into, of course, the cineramas and so many immersive devices that were being created in an analog way. So when you look back, then we start to understand that, yeah, I think that what we have been discussing in the last 20 years or more is actually a continuation of a collective desire of creating something beyond our physical space. But it is part of the same timeline of imagination. And then I'm going to show these images because I think that's very important. <laughs> well, I participated in many events of hacking art, some at MIT, some in the open source community. Um, and I really feel that when you look into a non-favorable context and you make that a reason to create something amazing, that's how we really make a big change and a big impact. And this is hacking, right? In the beginning, you try to make something happen, and then you see projects in the blockchain sho like showing up in the last decades. You see Sandbox, you see Decentraline, you see initiatives that defeat what we are used to see. And they are, of course, extremely disruptive and slowly show new possibilities to create. And lots of things, they were accidents, they were hacking that became products. And this is what it is, is the evolution of creativity and innovation. And then when you look here, you have a Decentraland and Sandbox map side by side. And what is beautiful about it is that we have been talking about surfing on the internet, roaming in the cyberspace, but then finally we started creating the connection between all this spatial understanding we have from the physical world in the virtual world. And we started reviewing what is really the perspective we have about land, about currency, about community, and a spatializing internet. Actually, my dad probably understands way more the central land and sandbox coordinates than just the abstract idea of being on the internet. So maybe we're getting closer to a lot of people that may not understand internet in its beginning, make it more accessible and creating amazing dynamics inside that space. And beside that, I think it's really key that the creative processes, they become more and more open source. Because if you really look into open source communities, they are willing to learn with each other, right? It's a learning process all the time. Everybody, somebody has something new to add and a new value to bring to the table. And then you see gradually, we see that every day, communities building things together, improving things together, and they have this big purpose that make events and content even more powerful. So here are some images that I really like to share. This was actually the Metaverse Fashion Week that we just wrapped up, and we had a lot of fun doing Dolce Gabbana catwalks and big brands like Elisa Abdundas, uh, Etro. They were part of that. There is a big list. And that was a great example of how brands are slowly entering the Metaverse, but they are working with the community of creators. All those pieces you see, they were created by creators in the, the platform. And this is beautiful because that's it. It's all we working together. Some other beautiful, ex I really like this one particularly. I had to put this image on, sorry. And then when you go into all this discussion, especially thinking about how the web is changing, I really feel this is a point I really enjoy. You know, it's not just about creating content. Content is important. But if we look to the internet we have today, and we compare maybe to the internet we had two decades ago, right? We have a web that potentially, potentially, because we have to work for that to happen, we cannot just take for granted, potentially we have a web from people to people and not necessarily from companies to people only, or big corporations to surveil or influence. Even big corporations are understanding that they have to collaborate with their users, right? And this is very key, because when you involve creators and users as a community, there is a new sense of belonging. And the belonging brings the protagonism. People feel that they have a voice. They can go and say, they can go and do. And that's when you see communities leading initiatives and pioneering. That's what we want to see, right? We don't want to be centralizing the power, but giving the power for people to make a change. And one example that I just brought is that on the web too, or let's say in the last two decades, we have been used to receive tools that already exist in a very framed way. And we really don't know how they were operating 
till I think the last years where we were facing that there was a lot of data extraction and for example, a lot of censorship that was decided by the platform, but I was not consulted, were you? I mean, I never received any, any <laughs> survey to know or participate on those decisions. So we see that it's very important that we take ownership of things we do, including how we shape those spaces. And then we see that when creators do that, they go beyond the physics, of course. It's metaverse, right? You're not supposed to do things as they are seen or exist in the physical space. You're supposed to challenge the physics. And that's why we have flying stores, huge Coca-Cola cans that you can swim inside, giant birthday cakes for you to play with, and flying Santa Claus with jetpacks and gifts. So this is an example that we can really go beyond. Oh yeah, we have catwalks with real cats from Dolce Gabbana. So <laughs> I think it's a beautiful way for us to think out of the box and see that there are many possibilities in the metaverse that can expand creativity uh, in general. And of course, generate engagement and belonging. But that's a good point that it's not just the engagement from the users. Of course, they are the core. They are the community of creators but is the engagement of the whole ecosystem, including brands. Slowly we see stores that are connecting with those communities and they are trying to dialogue directly with them. They are trying to create an experience that represents this new era, right? And for example, Samsung is a beautiful case we had that was completely organic. Uh, it never passed through any one of the foundation, which is our goal in the end. It actually entered through the community specifically and one day there was Samsung headquarter inside the central land so this is what we want to see and this is what we aim Sophia the robot okay and then here slowly I'm ending my considerations I know everybody here has been waiting for a while that when we look then into all these creative processes we see a transition right so we have this web 2 that we are used to see a while back ago, where, where you clearly see like centralized tools, right? And they are pretty much pre-edited. They pre-exist and you have to use them as they are. Uh, we have the user consuming pre-existing worlds and pre-existing content they cannot change. Um, quoting Shoshana Zuboff, an author that I really like, there is a lot of data outsourcing, data extraction, lack of transparency in some sense. And we're trying to change that. So we are trying to aim for open source creative tools, users building their own spaces, their own tools, why not, right? The web as a tool for social activities, creative activities, gamified experiences collectively, right? Our data is secured with blockchain. And of course, transparency in all levels, community engagement, and we should keep on framing things. So that's where we go to the XR, right? We are trying to get out of the comfort zone and unbox all the boxes, <laughs> but we still have computers and cell phones, right? And they are pretty much frames. We see the word framed all the time because we, we are used to it. That's our user experience. But I am a big believer that XR, of course, when it evolves enough and gets accessible enough to all of us, is going to make a big impact of we taking the metaverse that we are building or the virtual worlds outside of those screens. And that's why a lot of people ask me, especially during the Metaverse Fashion Week, okay, so do you think that physical catwalks will be replaced by digital? And that's why I said, it's not about or, it's about and. We will have and virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality and metaverses and the physical world and anything else we want. Because again, going back in the beginning, it's part of the same narrative we have been telling and trying to build together in our imaginations. And quoting somebody very relevant, Plato, <laughs> actually in his theories, the virtual world is started in our dreams. So why we're trying to separate what is not physical from the physical and actually is all part of the same existence of our creativity. So I hope that in the next years we see the metaverse coming out, which is already happening. Like you see a lot of initiatives in the fashion industry in using augmented reality, right? We have watch brands doing physical watches and digital watches connected to each other, which some people call digital. We do have like the regular 
wearable creations inside the metaverse, but they are associated to physical collections of brands. And then, of course, we have so many fun ways to do shopping, to experience elements with augmented reality. Today, that is already working. And hopefully, Magic Leap is going to launch something that we have been waiting for for a long time that is going to go beyond and be more intuitive for all of us. And with that said, and that's actually my, my last slide, the future is together. And when I say that, it's not just together in the sense of communities being together. It's in the sense that metaverses should operate together, right? We all are looking for interoperability to exist, but nothing should stop us from start collaborating among metaverses, creating portals in between metaverses, and experiences that could happen across many. This is for us to do, and we should start doing as soon as we can if you want to be strong and make a big impact. So I think together there is no limits, and it's about what we create and this continuum of collective creativity. This is my contact. If you want to stay in touch, please let's stay in touch. And I'm very glad that I had the opportunity to be here today with all of you. Thank you so much.